everyone, and welcome to part two of this mini lecture series on feature engineering. And this part is going to be about dictionaries. All right, so recall what we introduced in the video before was that our output y is still a linear model, or is generated by a linear model, but it's not no, no longer linear in z in our input, but it's linear with respect to the weights. And this is what matters for efficiency of training. And then we said, okay, this psi of z is our feature map, which takes the input and transforms it in a linear or in many cases nonlinear fashion to some other space, potentially higher dimensional, but can also be lower dimensional depending on your application and your needs. And then you have this linear relationship with the, the weights to, to create your output. And what I would like to discuss now is the, the case of dictionaries. And so let's just follow step by step through what these dictionaries mean and then we're going to have a look at, at a little bit of code to study this for a dynamic system or more specifically for the dynamic mode decomposition. Okay, so what do we do in this dictionary case? Step one is to define a dictionary, okay? So what this means is to select a set of so-called basis functions. Okay, so this means functions that are, allow us to span some sort of space. I will go to the details in a, in a second. And how do we select these basis functions? They can be problem specific. And this again has a very close connection to this expert knowledge thing. So you define sort of, of, of functions that you put in your dictionary that concern some, some quantity that you are really interested in. Like, and we had this in the video before, energy, momentum, and so on. So some transformation that yields um, data or quantities that are of particular interest and very tailored to your problem. But you can also alternatively pick generic functions. Okay, so one very popular approach to take is to take monomials, okay? So what this means is that you take um, polynomial terms, but then one by one, okay? So what your psi of z then becomes is, and I'm going to take an example with a two-dimensional input here, is that you get monomials of certain orders. So you take a constant function, you take maybe the z1, z2, and then you take combinations of these to a certain degree, right? So you can take z1 squared, z1 times z2, z2 squared, and so on, right? So this can go on as long as you like until you are at the end at, let's say, z1, z2 to the power of l minus 1, and then z2 to the power of l, okay? So whatever degree you take, and you get all these combinations, so you see this growth rather quickly with the, the, the value you choose for L. But this gives you a, a generic dictionary, so you lift your input into a <coughs> much higher dimensional space. And the reasoning behind this is that polynomials are suitable to approximate any smooth function to arbitrary accuracy, okay? So what you can use is you take these polynomial degrees and basically what this means is a linear combination of these polynomial terms, or monomials, which gives then a polynomial in the end, is capable of basically approximating a very, very large family of functions. So you get really, you know, a very nice generic transform that allows you to, you know, learn anything if you wish, right? If you only pick sufficiently many. But this also comes with all sorts of numerical issues. If you go too high, then this dictionary can become very ill pose, let's say, so that the regression problem in the end will be very hard to, to solve. But these are numeric issues. Conceptually, this is a very good choice and, and it's also frequently used. What you can also do is you take other generic functions like Fourier modes, for instance. Okay, so very, very popular. So what you have is you take, let's say, sine of z, cosine z, and then higher harmonics of this, let's say, okay? So you take cosine 
or sine and cosine to z and so on dot 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 until you are at the end sine lz cosine lz and the argument is essentially the same right so a, a combination of sines and cosines allows you to approximate any function which is known as the Fourier series expansion these are even orthogonal, orthogonal to one another so this means you have um, fewer stability issues than with these monomials okay and then you can go all sorts of other basis functions something i'm not going to write down explicitly but you can use or the, the formula but you can use what's called as or known as radial basis functions right so you basically put gaussian functions located at, at different places in your z domain and then use a linear combination of these gaussians in order to to reproduce your original function basically right so again a general function approximator and so you see that this lifting allows us now not to have a linear relation but we can express any function in terms of these basis functions monomials fourier modes or radial basis functions and so then what you can do is you use this or you have defined your dictionary this is your your expert choice let's say and then step two is to let's say lift the data right so you have your capital z this is your your data matrix to psi of z okay let's call it you know this is applied column wise now we can also give it a name let's call it psi with the subscript z in order to to denote that this is now our transformed input okay and so what you can do then is simply apply your favorite linear learning technique so what you do is learn on your data psi z so very nice you can use linear regression the problem becomes again a closed form solution problem of training these weights so very very nice and then the fourth step and this is not always easy is back to z okay and this may seem easy what you do is basically something like a projection step of psi z which means you have to you know get back from your basis expression to your original z for the monomials this is easy because you just would pick these individual components and you're done for others this can be more complicated because you need to take combinations of sines and cosines to get the z and the z v1 and z2 back so you see this is already very challenging so what you need and this is just um, in quotation marks because it's not actually like this what you would have to do is some sort of inverse transformation of your original right so of this psi z right and so this is hard to do and we need to think of ways uh, of doing this okay but now we have the general procedure so you see it's actually very easy the the, the main thing is you know define a dictionary then lift your data do learning as you are used to and then somehow get back to your original space and this is not so easy um, and what i would like to do now is to study um, this idea in terms of a dynamical system more specifically on the dynamic mode decomposition and what we're going to use or get is what's called the extended dynamic mode decomposition or edmd okay and so the idea is very very simple and follows exactly this procedure okay so what we're going to do is we are going to say we lift our data and remember in dmd we had the data matrix and the z dash was the same data matrix except it was shifted one time step ahead so every column of z is related to every column of z dash by a one time step linear system okay so what we're going to say is now in the lifted version we are not going to say so remember here we what we had in in dmd only was z dash was a times z okay so we assume that we can find a linear mapping from z to z dash and this would give us a, a matrix and then we could learn 
the eigenvector, or identify the eigenvectors and, and learn something about the dynamic in terms of these modes. <coughs> and so what the DMD does here is the same thing except only on the lifted data, right? So you define a dictionary and then you say, okay, let's assume that there exists this linear mapping, which obviously there does not exist a linear mapping if we have nonlinear dynamics, but let's just assume there is one. So that maps my lifted input to my lifted input at the next time step. And so the training is again a regression problem because we can identify this matrix as the best linear fit mapping Psi z to Psi z dash. So what we get is Psi z dash multiplied by Psi z and then the pseudo inverse of this. Okay, so linear regression thus as we had it for the dynamic mode decomposition but now on a lifted space. And so the hope is a lot better to find a linear model in this extended space instead of finding it in the original space. And so to study this in a bit more detail, let's have a look at a small code example where we're doing exactly this. And so I'm going to use one of my favorite examples, which is the, the nonlinear pendulum. Um, and well, I'm not going to go through, through the, the initial sets, but what you see is, you know, you have the, these co constants. I'm not considering friction, so it's going to oscillate back and forth forever. And I'm using a simple um, standard ODE solver from Julia. Okay, so I'm initializing with close to the uppermost position, which means it's a very long swing, and it has clearly a nonlinear behavior due to the sine uh, function, which is cannot be linearized if we are far away from the, from the lower equilibrium. And so what I'm going to do is I'm starting at this, this uppermost or close to uppermost position. I simulate for 20 seconds using the standard solver and then I get this plot. So the period of swinging once, forth and back again is roughly 13 seconds. This, I just identified this numerically. And so you see this is the behavior, right? So the blue one is the angle and the orange one is the angular velocity. So the second state. And the second plot here is just a phase diagram where I've plotted the angle against the angular velocity. And you see it's hard to, to model this by a linear system because I would need a, a circle or an ellipse in this case to have a linear system. And so what I can do now is I can anyways use my standard DMD algorithm. So I have stored my trajectory in this X vector, right? so time steps, and I'm defining Z and Z dash exactly as I did here. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm taking z to be the first um, n minus one entries and then z dash, again, n minus one entries, but shifted by one time step. And so learning the matrix A, uh, and I'm not going to use the pseudo, uh, the, 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 the SVD based re uh, reduction here because I don't not need it for two dimensional states. It's just an ordinary least squares identification if you wish. So exactly the formula that I've written here but not on a feature space here. And so what you see is I can compute the eigenvalues of A and the frequency and stability properties. All of this is something we have seen already. And then I can use the frequency to determine the period of the linear model that I've identified, right? It's just two pi divided by omega. And so what you get is these values, you see that it's a stable system, which is not surprising. The eigenvalue is basically one, which means it, it runs forever. This is the, the angular frequency and this is the period we get. So remember we had 13, this is 12.6, so it's a bit too fast. And these are the dynamics that we get now on our DMD model. So you see a linear model has to form an ellipse in this phase diagram. And here we have this clearly periodic oscillating behavior. And so, well, it's acceptable, let's say, but clearly not sufficient for, for an accurate model. And so what we can do now is we can lift this to polynomials, right? I, I've hidden the code here. You can look it up in the GitHub repo, but basically what the Psi Z does, it takes all combinations of monomial terms up to degree three that I've defined by my P term here. And then I'm doing exactly the same thing as before. So the A2 matrix is now Psi Z dash times the inverse of Psi Z. So exactly the formula that I have derived here. And then I can again look at frequencies and stability and so on. Maybe this is not so important here. Uh, what matters is that we get um, 10 dimensional feature vector at this point. And we get a frequency that is closer to the original one. Right? So you see 
this dash dotted line is now the, the feature transformed or in, in terms of the polynomial dictionary and it resembles the angle a lot better and it also resembles the angular velocity which is this orange dash dotted line a lot better. Still not perfect but you see in this diagram we have a good agreement. And so the final thing that we will do is now we further increase the polynomial degree now to 10 and now we're using the actual SVD, right? So the 10 dimensional polynomial will, will give me 66 terms in the end and I will reduce this by a factor of three so I'm only taking 22 of the SVD modes so to compress the DMB model and only find the leading 22 eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So here this is the exact uh, formula for cut off a little bit, but this is the formula for, for the SVD matrix, or the, D, the DMD matrix, excuse me. And if you do so, and let's omit the details for a bit, you see that this is now the dotted line here, and uh, the plot is getting a bit clumsy, but what's better visible is this one here. So you see that this higher dimensional dictionary now actually gives me a very good resemblance of this ellipsoid. Again, not perfect, because the pendulum is surprisingly hard to learn using using dynamic mode decomposition and in particular it's very very hard to change frequencies or basically impossible but you see that you know with this dictionary we get fairly close and so I hope you have gotten a good overview what what dictionaries can do and how useful they are you know it's very important how to pick the entries of a dictionary but this is you know a matter of expertise in the end and so we're going to close here and discuss another way to identify features, namely data-driven linear ones, in the next video. Thank you.